I don't know if your personality changes, but you're different when you speak German than when you speak English. Right. The way you say things is different. It doesn't translate one to one. Yeah. And I see that as a thing. You know, some people manage to carry that over. They're the same way they are when they speak German as when they speak English. But you do notice subtle differences yeah, in the definitely. way you communicate. Yeah. Definitely. So are you sweeter in English or German? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm probably nicer in German, actually. Really? Mm-hmm. Welcome to One Day in Vienna. Our guest today, Gregory Weeks. Name Gregory Weeks, Geburtsland USA, Ankunft in Wien, 1995, Familienstand, verheiratet, Beruf Historiker. I'm your host, Lauren Love, and welcome to this podcast where we're going to be uncovering those memorable anecdotes about this magical city that, let's face it, we all love and hate in moments. The expats featured on this show will be enlightening us as to how they navigated becoming a local in Vienna, often with a splattering of hilarious culture clashes to boot. Hello and welcome to One Day in Vienna. I'm your host, Lauren Löw, and today we are at the gorgeous Café Breunerhof with Dr. Gregory Weeks. Hi, Gregory. Good morning. So with our podcast, what we're doing is we're finding out about somebody's special one day in Vienna uh, and we're asking different expats around the city. So I'd like to start off with asking you, what brought you to Vienna? Okay. Um, I started out in Austria and Graz. Uh, I was enrolled in the uh, PhD program in contemporary history, uh, in Austrian history. And after I, I had been there a couple of years, I came because my wife had finished her law degree, her doctorate, uh, to Vienna because there aren't a lot of jobs in Graz. Uh, and then we moved to Vienna. And um, then, uh, you know, I started reinventing my life in Austria after <laughs> having already been in uh, in. In Graz. And we're going to talk to you now about your one day in Vienna. So is it your first day in Vienna that you're going to be telling us about? Uh, My first uh, time in Vienna was, of course, landing here because when I went to Graz, uh, there wasn't a direct flight. And I came to Vienna and I had to get off, you know, at the airport and then get to the train station, which was the Südbahnhof at the time, uh, which is totally different now with the Hauptbahnhof. I mean, it looked like a wreck. You know, it was this turn of the century, mid-century train station with this funny art project inside with this eye. And it's just gray, you know, and, and you just think, why didn't they tear this down, right? Der Wiener Südbahnhof, auf dessen Areal der heutige Hauptbahnhof steht, war schon früher einer der wichtigsten Verkehrsknotenpunkte Österreichs. Der Südbahnhof wurde 1841 eröffnet und entwickelte sich im Laufe der Zeit dann zu einem bedeutenden internationalen Bahnhof. Während des Zweiten Weltkriegs erlitt der Südbahnhof schwere Schäden durch Bombenangriffe, wurde in den 1960er Jahren wieder aufgebaut, um letztlich im Jahr 2000 dem heutigen modernen Wiener Hauptbahnhof zu weichen. Neben dem Bahnhofsbetrieb beherbergt das Gelände heute auch Einkaufsmöglichkeiten, Restaurants und Büros, was ihn zu einem wichtigen kommerziellen und sozialen Zentrum macht. So you arrive in Vienna, you're at the Südbahnhof. Yeah, I'm at the Südbahnhof and, you know, of course, my, I already spoke German by that point because I had studied in Bavaria. Okay. Um, but Austrian German and, uh, you know, Viennese uh, friendliness, uh, you know, it took me forever to figure out what train it was. I mean, this is before the internet and you, know, you had the train schedules that you had to read and the South train station, of course, has these big, long schedules. You, know, you have to find the right time. And, you know, you're coming in on an international flight, so you don't know exactly when you're going to arrive, when you're getting on the train. So I'm lugging the luggage for a year abroad, uh, you know, in these duffel bags with Frisbees on the bottom so that they don't wear through, right? <laughs> um, and carting these two huge duffel bags onto the train. And then I get to Graz, right? And, you know, I'm just like, well, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm taking a taxi, you know, to this place where I'm living. Um, and, uh, and so you were then going to get your doctorship? Was that Well, the- I didn't start out that way. I started okay. out just uh, wanting to come and spend a year to do research for the okay. doctorate. 
And, you know, everything changed, right? You meet somebody, you decide you're going to stay, and then you think, well, it's expensive in the United States. I had funding from uh, the Rotary uh, mm -hmm. Foundation for a year. And then I had the problem, of course, because, you know, I didn't have uh, money. I had to figure out a way to get funding to fund it. So I worked as a, an English teacher in Ingelsdorf in Graz. And I also applied for an, a graduate scholarship, also Vinton Stipendium, at the University of Graz, which I was really surprised when I got it uh, over all these other people. But I guess they thought I was needy enough. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I wasn't actually a, a graduate of the University of Graz at that point, And they gave me a graduate scholarship. You know, somebody who's yes. graduated from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't Winning. much. It was you know, something like uh, 10,000 Austrian shillings, you know, Still. and, you know, but you can manage to live uh, quite a while, you yeah. know, probably eight months uh, on 10,000 shillings back then. You know, now Definitely. I would never be able to make it very long on that. Uh, things have changed a lot. So you received your doctorate then back in Vienna. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got it in Graz and then I came back to Vienna. Okay. So you moved here in 1995. So I can imagine Vienna was very, very different to the Vienna we're sitting in today. Can you t talk us through that first day that you had in okay. Vienna? Yeah, I mean, the biggest problem I had when I came to Vienna because uh, uh, we moved in, must have been end of August, uh, 95 from Graz to Vienna. And uh, I didn't have a job, right? Okay. Because, you know, I was still a student nominally, but you have to have something to live on. And it's much more expensive to live in Vienna than it is to live in Graz. Um, and so I went around different places and I went to the uh, America Institute in the Operngasse number four. And I walked upstairs and uh, I introduced myself to the director, um, Margareta Weisgerber. Um, and uh, I said, you know, is there any kind of a stamtisch here in Vienna? And she said, no, we don't have anything like that. Um, because there was such a thing in Graz, you know, with students from the different universities in, in Graz. And so I asked her about that and I gave her my contact information and I left and I didn't think anything more of it. Um, and then about a week and a half later, I get this call. Would you be interested in teaching an English course for us? And uh, so I taught uh, an English course called Excellence in English. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, the Excellence in English course was a lot of really difficult people who had been learning English for years and no teacher could handle them. And uh, there's one woman in particular, I remember, who made my life hell because she would argue about every grammar point. You know, <laughs> uh, luckily, my father had been an English teacher okay, so and then was a professor a of education. <laughs> and so... You know, I would, you know, it, and, and after I left, it was like, well, who do you leave this to? Because any teacher who takes over this class is going to <laughs> uh, have a rough time of it. But the American Institute is, you know, in this old palais, um, historicist uh, palais, and basically not much had been renovated uh, and, uh, you know, uh, from – probably right after the war. It was the way it had been in the 1890s. Yeah. So once you got the job, you were thinking, I'm winning. This is great. Yeah, it's and great then, when you're on a roll, right? And then uh, did you... Did you celebrate with your wife? Did you like go out afterwards? And was that well, nice? Well, she was, she was doing, um, what they call the Gerichtsjahr. So she was mm -hmm. doing an externship with the court. So she was in Tung out in, in lower Austria. And so what do you do when you're, you're sitting there? I mean, you know, it's September, it's cold, right? You think, ah, uh, do I want to go home? What should I do? You go to a coffee house, right? <gasps> Ah, so you went to a coffee house. I went to this coffee house. Oh. Um, and that's it. You you know, not knowing anything about Vienna and discovering Breunerhof uh, on the first day is pretty lucky, I'd say. It's this place, as a historian, you look at it, you look at the um, uh, upholstery and uh, the architecture, and you think, yeah, this is why I came to Austria. So, Gregory... We know that Vienna is famous uh, for us expats to have culture clashes in. Um, could you tell us about your most infamous culture clash? Most infamous. I was doing research on the Vienna police and I was in the police headquarters on the ring, uh, which is not far from the university. And I went in there and you know, I'm doing the research and they say, well, you know, we have this um, a cafeteria upstairs, which no longer exists. And they had these full-time people, you know, serving the food on, you know, metal trays to the policemen, right? And so I'm up there and there are these guys from the, the Vega, you know, which is the SWAT team in the steel-toed boots with German shepherds, you know, named Max. <laughs> and I'm walking through the line. I get to the end of the line and she tells me the amount that I have to pay, which was in shillings. And I'm short 10 groschen, right? which is like one half of one cent. right? And there's a little cup 
next to the cash register. And if you're Austrian, you know where this is going. But if you're American, right, it's always need a penny, take a penny. And there was nothing on it. And there are all these, you know, like loose change and coins, right? And so I automatically, without thinking about it, reach into this little cup and take 10 groschen out of it. And the cashier looks at me and says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking 10 groschen out of the cup. <laughs> and she says, that's my tip money. And I'm standing there with guys with submachine guns and dogs in the middle of the police headquarters. And I try to explain to her, right, in German, right? And she's just looking at me like I'm from the moon. Like she doesn't believe me. Like, you know, what idiot in the world in the middle of police headquarters would steal 10 Groschen? And, you know, I went back and apologized to her later. And she was looking like, you know, the original battle axe, uh, like she wanted to kill me. And I just thought, hopefully I'm not going to lose my visa. Hopefully I'm not going to be deported. Uh, you know, who knows what could happen? happen to you if in the middle of police quarters you you still one half of one cent you know and and this woman is like that's my tip I was like what are you going to do with the 10 groschen you know uh, <laughs> seriously <laughs> lighten up <laughs> uh, no but i also tried to explain uh, in austria no shoes no shirt no service <laughs> because in austria in the summer <laughs> That would never happen. <laughs> People just walk around with nothing on. <laughs> well, you know, I taught out. I taught out in Kaisermoon uh, for oh. years. You know, after, and you get all sorts of strange things out in Kaisermoon. You know, Crazy. and then the TV show Kaisermoon Blues came yes. on, of course. And there's a for certain a amount of truth to yes. that, um, if, if you if you know the show at all. Uh, uh, and those characters, you know, I've met some of the actors, and I just think, you know, you did such a great job. You were so believable. Yeah, no, um, I but I have to say that was an absolutely brilliant culture clash. Uh, I, best one I this ever. was the best I have ever. Had others, no, so, this but... is absolute. This was so brilliant. <laughs> so, um, we are in Breunerhof, and we we've, we've heard that your first day ended in this lovely cafe house. Tell us why that you've brought us to Breunerhof today, okay. Gregory. Uh, there's also a connection with Breunerhof uh, because the Austro-American Society is upstairs in this building. Okay. And uh, the club rooms are on the first floor, and the office is on the second floor. And the building was actually the home of Engelbert Dolfus, who was the chancellor oh. uh, in the 1930s, after 1934, with Austrofascism. And apparently he used to leave because he was a very short guy. He would wear a top hat to make himself look taller. And there are stories about him uh, leaving, of course, uh, and also being uh, here in the coffee house. Um, you know, there's a lot of history um, in this part of Vienna. And do you feel that you've kind of hit the jackpot being a historian and living in in Vienna. Oh, I do. I mean, I, I'm sure that all my uh, friends from college and school, I mean, I'm, I know I'm the person who's moved furthest away when I went back to a class reunion. And I don't think anybody else is living. I have one friend who's living in France who studied with me in high school. But beyond that, most people don't move far from home. They're, they're stuck in the same county they were born in. So you're here to stay? I don't think I'm going anywhere. <laughs> And we're asking all of our guests, so you, you studied in German, you, you mentioned you studied in Bavaria and then in Graz. So I have a feeling that your German level is pretty high. Talk to us about your relationship with German. Okay. I mean, I certainly have an American accent, uh, which uh, I decided I, I would just give up on trying to you know, change that because I wasn't going to get away uh, from these prejudices against English speakers. So I just adopted it. I said, if Schwarzenegger can become governor of California, I can become uh, mayor of Vienna. <laughs> uh, I don't know if, if Mayor Ludwig would like to hear that, but... Uh, you can just borrow those large chains. I, I just, I want about. some I chains. I would suit you uh, perfectly. <laughs> So do you speak German at home or do you and your wife speak English? Uh, we speak German most of the time. Okay. Um, so your life I, really is in German now? Yeah, it has been for years. And when teaching English, you're happy when you can go home and speak another language because it allows you to shut off from work. You know, I like to go home and not have to think about English or English grammar because I've been answering questions for four hours. And, you know, there's a learning curve, you know, with all uh, sorts of, of words in German. My passive vocabulary is obviously... Um, larger than my active vocabulary. And there are a lot of, um, you know, like sayings that I don't remember when I hear them, I know them, but I wouldn't use them on my own. When I was in Germany, I spent uh, every day I tried to learn three new sayings. Huh. I had books and I would go through and try to memorize them. And you can't remember all of them, but you can remember a lot of them. You know, yeah. things like, ich schlafe wie ein Murmeltier. I slept like a log in yeah. English, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you don't know the idi idiomatic expression, uh, then you have a problem when you do translations. Yeah, jeder hat ein Vogel. Yeah. Jeder hat ein Vogel. I mean, this is like one of the ones where I'm really like, what? Well, my, one of my uh, all-time expressions and favorite expressions of Viennese is Geh schleichti. Yeah. 
Gay verschwind. <laughs> disappear, get lost. Huh? Uh, and you speak German at home with your in your in your family, sure. and you teach in German or English. Um, I, I usually teach in English, although okay. I mean I have lectured in German. I lectured in advertising and brand management mm -hmm. in German at the University of Vienna. Okay, but uh, and do you feel a difference at this point? Do you feel that you're Your, I think my personality, I mean, your personality, I don't know if your personality changes, but you're different when you speak German than when you speak English. Right. The way you say things is different. It, it doesn't translate one to one. Yeah. And I see that as a thing. You know, some people manage to carry that over. They're the same way they are when they speak German as when they speak English. But you do notice subtle differences yeah, in the definitely. way you communicate. Yeah. Definitely. So are you sweeter in English or German? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm probably nicer in German, actually. Really? Um, okay, so tell us some about your favorite German words. Okay, my all-time favorite German word is lästig. Das Wort lästig beschreibt eine Situation oder eine Person, die wiederholt stört. Es kann sich auf Belästigungen beziehen, die die Ruhe stören oder die Laune trüben. Der Begriff kann auch verwendet werden, um auf etwas hinzuweisen, das lästig im Sinne von hinderlich oder unbequem ist, Etwa, wenn eine Aufgabe viel Zeit und Mühe erfordert. In zwischenmenschlichen Beziehungen kann lästig darauf hindeuten, dass eine Person als übermäßig aufdringlich oder nervig empfunden wird, was zu Frustration oder Unbehagen führen kann. Lästig, tell us about it, why? Ir irritating. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's how it is. Uh, Austrians are always irritated. Uh, but if you smile at them, go, go to the supermarket and try doing it not like an Austrian. I had a friend who's a Canadian psychologist, and I watched her go in the supermarket and walk through the line, and the woman just brightened up, the, the cashier. And I said to her, what did you do? And she said, I ask her every time I go in how her day has been and how she's doing, and I smile at her. And I thought, you know, maybe that's the secret to living a happy life in Vienna. Oh, yes. And so, lästig is one of your words, and what's another one? What's I like your... spelunke. Ooh, that's a fantastic word. Tell us. Uh, okay. Why? Spelunke in English would translate as a dive, yeah? And I remember as a student, people trying to drag me into these, you know, subterranean bars in, in Graz or Vienna. And I just said, I'm not going into that spelunke. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and I, I, it's, it's a word you don't hear very often. And yeah. people are always surprised when I use it. Uh, may, maybe not high academic uh, German. But, uh, you know... Uh, I have a theory about Austria and German, right? If you look at great literature in German, a lot of it comes from Austria. And the theory is that the dialects in Austria, that includes people like Elfriede Jelinek, influence the writing in high German. I mean, Elfriede yes. Jelinek, whether you like her political opinions or not, has some of the most beautiful German. Uh, and they play with this use of dialect along with the high language that they're writing in. And it gives them a lot of variety, which you don't have so much in Germany. But, uh, you know, having studied German literature, I tested out of the first two years of German at, at the university. And my first seminar at the university in the United States was Middle High German Literature. So I was reading Valtari Lied and Hildebrand's Lied and all these things. And I hadn't read any modern literature, you know. And then I got to Germany and I first started reading, you know, German novels from the 20th century. And I thought, boy, this is a totally different language. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, well, But very modern, I have to say. What I love about dialect here is it's so modern. It like it, My husband, for example, would never write to his friends in Hochdeutsch. He would always write in the dialect of Steyr, where he's from. And it's very interchangeable. It's very personal. And it's incredibly modern, which I love. No, I mean, I, I like that a lot as well. I yeah. agree with you. I mean, uh, it's uh, absolutely fantastic, you know. To, uh, and I, I think it gives you a different lease on, on life when you have studied German literature. But, you know, I'd read things in German that German speakers hadn't read. Yeah. I, I knew 40 different words for horse uh, from middle <laughs> high German. And I joked that it was like the difference between a Mercedes and a Fiat Panda, you know, that you have like a yeah. Gaul and then you have a Steed, uh, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these are great things. I mean, it's good to know 40 different words for horse. Not that I need them very often, but uh, <laughs> histel. <laughs> so, Dr. Weeks, thank you. Gregory, thank you so, so much for joining us today and telling us your hilarious uh, culture clash stories and uh, about your wonderful first day in Vienna. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You love Vienna too and want to learn German? Innes Vienna will get you there. 
Vienna's best language school offers a variety of courses and trainings at different levels, at different times, and at different intensities. All information about Innes Vienna and today's guests can be found in the show notes. And there we also explain all other German words, terms, and Viennese areas from this episode. Thanks for listening. Auf Wiederhören.